really a pleasure to be here and to talk about uh, some, some work about, well, hopefully with some relevance to machine learning. Um, it's, uh, I view it as, as uh, basically the intersection of probability theory and optimization. Um, though this, I'm gonna show at the end something about scaling laws, which does sort of break outside of that exact paradigm. Um, so I just wanna start with a little bit about uh, a different point of view on how to do optimization. Um, it's certainly not the standard one. And it's it's sort of useful for the the, the type of thing I'm going to talk about, um, and so I just want to make a comparison. Um, so if you look in a, a textbook on on uh, stochastic convex optimization, probably the first setting that you would end up with is something like like this, where you assume that you have an extremely nice objective function which has. Uh, which is convex and in fact strongly convex, and so this this risk here is some uh, some objective function which which has a Hessian and its Hessian has eigenvalues bounded between two constants. And this is just the nicest situation you can be in because you can prove all sorts of really sweet uh, exact upper bounds of risk guarantees and stuff like that. So if you take uh, sort of a standard standard SGD, this is a single batch SGD. By the way, I'm going to talk almost exclusively about single batch SGD. If you wanna ask me about mini batch things, I can say things about that at the end. Um, <clears throat> then you get this, this nice uh, linear convergence. And I know that there's kind of a parlor game that happens in optimization communities where people talk about, well, th this is a really nice assumption, but it must be that one of the two assumptions is wrong. Like, it's not useful for machine learning because things are not really convex or things are not really smooth. And I, I'm actually here to offer even a third possibility, which is that things, there, there are problems which are smooth and convex, but you just miss the picture with this set of assumptions. So there's a, there's a more refined set of assumptions you can make on what the Hessian looks like and you get really interesting phenomena. So the whole thing that I'm gonna talk about today exists in that space. So it's, it's about, strongly convex, smooth problems, but with an interesting uh, Hessian spectrum. Okay, so this is kind of a motivating problem. It's a, it's a pretty simple one. Um, I wanna do um, a class prediction problem. I'm gonna, gonna do it with the CIFAR picture data set. And I'm just going to, I'm gonna take two classes and then make a, an L2 loss to try to predict the classes. So there will be some activation function sigma. Um, there'll be a weight matrix, which will just be just a totally IID uh, normal random matrix. And, and then I'm gonna, well, look at this risk. And uh, it's a nice L2 problem. And um, you, can, you can compute um, its spectra. So this is, this is the spectra of the Hessian. And you see some curve that looks like this. Um, it's actually an interesting curve if you're a random matrix theorist. I'll say a little bit about random matrix theory because it's relevant here. It is, in fact, a random matrix session. Um, the, the, the ratio of the, uh, the smoothness to the condition number, the, the condition number, this mu over L, is, is about 10 to the minus sixth in this picture. Uh, if you run SGD, and there's a lot of stuff going on in this picture, so probably too much, um, the, the action happens a lot sooner. So um, something is happening between about 10 to the three to the 10 to the fifth iterations. And the risk bound that you'd get from the condition number is, is happening out here at 10 to the sixth. So it sort of misses the picture that uh, this, is the, this is the empirical risk that, that something is happening here uh, between, uh, well, something in the middle is happening. And I would actually just like to understand this figure. Like if you want, <laughs> The, the, one ver the one word version or the one sentence version of what I'm trying to do is just really in detail understand this picture. So, you know, what are the, what are the risk curves? Uh, why, why is this something happening at 10 to the fourth? How, how do I see it in the, in the, in the eigenvalues? Um, okay. So I'm sorry, I'm not discussing fully the picture here. This N is the number of samples. Um, this, this is a streaming situation. It's actually not C4 10, it's the C4 5M, which is some uh, generative extension of, of CIFAR-10 to allow you to pretend like you can do a streaming version of this where you have infinite data. 
Um, you might ask about the population risk. It's very similar in, in, this, in this picture. Population risk is really a, a test risk in this situation. Um, so something is, is happening around, around this point. Um, and well, you can kind of reverse engineer what the relevant eigenvalues are if, you, if you're very coarse about figuring out, well, how, how big should the eigenvalue be so that it starts to participate uh, this is a bad thing to try to do, but you, you could try to do that, and you would see that maybe this range of eigenvalues is relevant. Um, the picture actually distorts something. So, so actually, uh, if, I, if I, instead of showing you a histogram of the eigenvalues, I show you uh, just a scatter plot of the eigenvalues. So I take the eigenvalues and I put them in, in decreasing order and then plot them against their value. You, you see something quite nice. Um, which is, well, on a log plot, uh, the, 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 the y-axis is mislabeled, um, that, that's just the, the intensity, the, the value of the eigenvalue. Uh, you, you see a very nice straight line on a log plot. In other words, um, you, have a, you have a power law relationship. And of course, it's not perfect. I mean, the power law stops at some point. So this is if you do uh, without any sort of activation function, and this is with the activation function. You see a pretty nice straight line, just just to point out. So, if if in a, if in a very simplified worldview you wanted a sense of what this type of data distribution looks like, well, the Hessian spectra has some kind of power law. Yeah, you're applying the activation function on the eigenvalues. No, I, I take the 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 data matrix. I apply a multiplier by a random matrix. I do an entry-wise activation function, and then I look at the uh, the singular values of that matrix. Yeah. Okay. <clears throat> so, um, so I want to say a couple of things. So this is this is the the sort of setup. Um, and so now I want to tell you the the plan the plan for the talk. Um, so I want to. I, I need to give you a way to describe the loss curves that you see out of this. I, I want to get really precise statements about the loss curves. Um, the loss curves are going to take as input data about the problem that's going to be eigenvalue data about the problem. And so I want to say a little bit about random matrix theory. I'm not going to do a lot about random matrix theory. The point is not to be a random matrix talk, but there's a relevant piece of random matrix theory that's related to that problem I just showed you. <laughs> And in the final part, I'll, I'm going to set up a, um, um, an exercise that you could do with this where uh, you, can, you can actually see lots of interesting qualitative properties of SGD. And in particular, you can, do, um, you, you can try to evaluate um, uh, for a given amount of, of flops how big you should make your model, like a very, very simplified version of model, just gonna be a multiplying your data by a random matrix, uh, in order to achieve the best loss. And it would be sort of relevant to this, this CFAR situation. And uh, I have to say, I mean, I'm, I'm not gonna talk about language models, but there's, th this, this actually came from research into language models, uh, these kind of power law fits um, my pictures are all about CFAR, sorry. So if you like language models, there's, a, there's another story there. Okay. Um, so I want, to, I want to give a way to actually describe a loss curve. So I'm gonna, I'm gonna, I'm gonna uh, give a way to, to, which will be finally effective for, for computing things about loss curves, taking spectral data as it put. Um, so I'm just going to do a very uh, simple setup. I, I'm going to look at a, a streaming Gaussian linear regression problem. It's, it's still a nice problem. Um, um, the idea will be that there's some underlying data distribution. It's, it's normally distributed. There's a fixed weight matrix, the W, which is in the way. It's, you could think of it as uh, your, the true data is being filtered somehow. So you're observing WX, you're not observing X and you're trying to fit beta x. And then I want to run um, streaming SGD, which is this, this Markov chain. So I'm just going to update my, my thetas according, according to this rule. 
And I'm, I'm going to fix uh, fix the gamma, which is reasonable in a in a least squares context. Okay. Um, so it turns out, um, there's a beautiful identity that holds for this uh, loss curve. If I evaluate the expectation over the samples of of the data, so I'm going to fix the W. The W is a fixed matrix in the background. It will be random in a moment, but uh, fix that. And this expected risk solves some kind of equation. Um, it, uh, it's the solution of uh, an underlying forcing function, F, plus a, a convolution. And this is a, this is a straight linear convolution of two functions of a kernel K with psi. So it's an implicit equation. It, uh, you, you don't, you know, you can't just write down a formula from this. You have to solve it. Um, and I want to say something about solving it. So this isn't useful unless we can do things with this equation. And I, I'll say a couple things about that. Um, K, K you can interpret as the, the influence of SGD noise. Uh, if you took a very, very small step size, this thing would shrink. You would be only looking at F. F would be the dominant term. So K... Uh, this is the noise contribution. Then. F, if you had F by itself, is some kind of uh, uh, loss under gradient descent. It's actually not quite loss under gradient descent. If you want this to be an equality, uh, there's some extra bit of Gaussian noise that gets thrown in there, but it's basically irrelevant. <laughs> I think I have a formula, if you're interested. Um, so this, this is the formula. Uh, you can compute, there's some matrix A, you form it out of the k hat. K hat is the covariance matrix of the data you observe. Not the, so it's, it has a W inside of it. And, and gamma is the step size. Uh, and this is with, this, this is with a zero initialization. OK. Um, it may still look like uh, whatever. This is some big formula. Is there anything you can do with it? Let me say one easy thing you can do um, right away, uh, you, you can actually describe exactly uh, when this is convergent. And I mean convergent now in the sense that the loss curve is bounded. I, I'm not going to specify whether it goes to zero. In principle, you could have neighborhood convergence. There's, or or if, if you actually have an interpolating loss function, you'll, have, you'll actually have convergence to zero. But uh, you, you can really write down an if and only if condition for, for this to be Convergent, and that's that's nice. If if you really want to understand, for example, large step size as you approach the stability threshold, you really want to know exactly when this is convergent, and it's a nice simple problem. So you can do it. Uh, there's two things that need to happen. You need to have this some operator norm less than one, uh, but you need to have a second condition, which is kind of the second moment condition, and this this noise term has to be less than one also. Um, uh, you, the first one looks a lot like a type of uh, max smoothness bound, so you need to be less than the, the max smoothness, and then this is some other kind of condition which is specific to SGD. Uh, I would say that in, in basically all of the problems I'm going to talk about, and I, I sort of think that probably in a randomly taken problem from the world, it's really the second condition which is going to be affecting you. I can try to justify that. Um, certainly in the problems I'm doing today, it will, it will sort of always be the second condition that overtakes the first. Uh, you can also get the limit loss from this. So with an equality, the, the limit loss is this uh, limiting risk, which is just the, the, minimum, uh, the minimum risk of the actual problem you're trying to solve, plus uh, times an additional term, which is the loss due to SGD noise. So if this is zero, then this goes to zero. Otherwise, it goes to some constant, which is larger than the true, the true risk. Okay. Um, so actually, this is this theorem is what I need to do the scaling loss stuff. But I wanted to make a, a small diversion just to say a little bit about this equation. Um, I did this, I, I did a computation. It's, it's not a hard computation. I, I said it was a theorem, but uh, it's, it's not so hard to do this to, to prove that this stuff holds for the Gaussian problem. Um, 
you, you might ask, to what extent was it important that Gaussian was here? Like, I put Gaussian, I put least squares, it's so simple. Maybe this is just completely irrelevant. Um, so, in, there is a setting where you can show that there's a that the Gaussian doesn't matter. And actually, the setting the Gaussian doesn't matter is exactly basically when this condition overtakes the, the first condition. Uh, another way to say that is that the operator norm of the covariance is much larger than the trace of the covariance. So if your problem is super one-dimensional, your covariance k is just going to be one eigenvalue. The operator norm is going to equal to the trace. And I have no universality to tell you about it. The Gaussian is super important. The data distribution is super important. But when the trace of the covariance starts to get big, so if you have a high dimensional problem and there's lots of eigenvalues that contribute, then this problem, first of all, the Voltaire equation simplifies. So uh, the convergence criteria just turns into this, you see that, this trace condition here. Uh, it's also true that the loss curve concentrates. So instead of seeing, uh, you don't have to take the expected risk curve over the data. You can just run a single run of this and the risk will be concentrated around its mean. And, and also the Volterra model simplifies. So instead of, instead of these terms, you can, you, can, you can do some approximation and you end up with, with this equation. Um, uh, basically all that changed were these, uh, be, because gamma is forced to be small due to this, uh, due to this trace condition, these, uh, these terms, these gamma squared things become uh, irrelevant and you end up with exponentials. So this, this now starts to look like this is the, this is the behavior of gradient flow uh, on, the, on, the, on the loss and the, the noise term changes a little bit too. Okay, um, so this is a theorem. This is what the theorem looks like for that. I don't know if it's the optimal theorem, but it's a theorem. This is with uh, Elizabeth Collins Woodfin, who's a postdoc at McGill, that if you, uh, if you look at streaming SGD on linear regression, and I, I'm, being, uh, I'm being vague about the data distribution, I'm happy to give you as much details as you want, but, but it, has to be, it has to be some kind of nice data distribution. It's not any arbitrary data distribution will not work. Um, then the, the risk curve of streaming SGD on linear regression will concentrate around this Voltaire equation. Um, the concentration is, there's a D here. So this is a statement which is good when the dimension is big uh, because we actually made changes to the, to the risk curve uh, to do it. Uh, so you have to decide if you accept that that's a valid type of comparison, which is different than other types of comparison. And, and you need some kind of high dimensionality. So high dimensionality means the operator norm. This is kind of a choice. You can make this bounded, but then this is no longer a choice. So the trace of the covariance should be big. So the ratio is, is big. Trace of K over operator norm is big. And you need some kind of um, good concentration to measure properties of the data vector. So hansen right inequality is the type of thing that works. I just want to briefly mention um, there's, there's some other extensions in this direction. You, you, can, you can do other types of Voltaire equations. Uh, there's, you, you can do this for multi-pass SGD. So that's no longer streaming where you fix a data set and now you run a uh, mini batch SGD on it. Again, the least squares problem. Um, and then the, the parameters become the empirical parameters of the problem. So the risk is the empirical risk. Uh, and the covariance matrix is the empirical covariance matrix of the data. And then the theorem is the same. You need even stronger assumptions on the data for that to work. Um, and there's also, you can do a non-Gaussian version of this. Uh, I think we're still exploring that a little bit more. Um, so we have one paper. So this is with Elizabeth Collins Woodfin again, at Courtney Paquette and in Sarusi, who's also a postdoc at McGill. Um, uh, you can do a, a non-Gaussian version, uh, a non, sorry, non-L2 version of this. The, 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 the Voltaire equation becomes more complicated, like a, a lot more complicated. So it's, it's, 
still some kind of deterministic equation you can solve to describe the risk deterministically uh, in time, but it's not just uh, it's not a convolution Volterra equation. So, um, so there is something, but it's it's uh, uh, it's more to work with. Okay, so I just to summarize what that was. I introduced the Volterra equation, a Volterra convolution Volterra equation. It's a way to describe the risks of uh, SGD on a, on a least squares problem. It takes as input two functions, this, this uh, loss function f, which is some sort of gradient descent loss curve, and it has this kernel curve k. And both of them um, re require some sort of information on the spectral properties of the data um, and also how the target aligns with properties of the, uh, of the eigenvalues. So you, you need some inputs. And the inputs to describe the problem I was talking about at the start is some kind of random matrix theory. So I took some data, I multiplied by a random W, applied an activation function. So I have some kind of random matrix and I want to say something about that. Okay, so I don't wanna say um, um, a random matrix is a big subject and I'm gonna do a very brief intro to random matrix theory just so that there's some key key concepts here. Um, um, so the matrix I'm gonna talk about is just this one. So this is a K hat, which is some uh, K W W transpose K. Uh, w is a Gaussian random matrix and K is a fixed matrix. Um, and I wanna talk about some eigenvalue properties of this matrix um, as, a, as an input being, uh, input being K. Okay, so K is some sort of uh, covariance matrix, hidden covariance matrix, and then a W is this random embedding that I'm going to do. Um, uh, it is possible to do things with nonlinear things. Uh, I have it, we don't have the theory worked out for it. There is some theory that's not exactly related to what I'm doing. Uh, I, I think it's an interesting research direction to do things for nonlinear stuff. So there, there is a, there's a bottleneck here a little bit about doing the theory for random matrix theory to make it work for nonlinear stuff. Okay, um, if you've never seen it before, this is the Marchinko-Pasteur law. It is the eigenvalue distribution that you see if the latent covariance matrix is the identity. It's a very nice uh, spectral distribution. This is a histogram of eigenvalues that you see in W transpose W. And you can, uh, you can fit a curve to it, and this curve comes from theory. Um, I want to say something about that curve, but I want to do it in a little bit more generality because I really care about what happens when I have other Ks. So this is a similar picture, and um, I'm going to just try something which has this kind of power law decay like at the start. So I take some diagonal matrix of J to the minus alpha. If it's not clear why I can use a diagonal matrix, it's because the Gaussian is rotation invariant, so it actually just depends on the eigenvalues of the, of the covariance matrix, not, not how they're represented. Um, and, and this curve also comes from theory, and I want to say a word about what the theory is, about how you describe this orange curve that describes the spectrum. Uh, just for fun, here's a, here's a range so that you can sort of see what it looks like as you change, um, change the power law parameter. I hope it looks a little bit like that set of Z4 eigenvalues that you saw. That, that was the point. That's the propaganda that does look like that. That's supposed to look like that. Um, um, it's not supposed to be exact in any way. It's not like I know the underlying latent model of CIFAR and I can apply something to it. But it is. it seems to be a relatively effective model. Um, I want to point out something. This is log. I didn't write log. This is the log base 10 on the bottom. And this is a fixed size matrix. These, these are very small eigenvalues. So you're getting very small eigenvalues here. This is 10 to the minus six, and you get some kind of curve, uh, some kind of curve that appears. Um, so that's important. So these, and, and in fact, as dimension grows, uh, these Ds and these Vs, this, this bulk of eigenvalues is gonna move further and further to the left. So it, it, it's going off to infinity. It's not at a fixed location. Going off to zero, negative infinity in log scale. Um, if you look at the uh, if you look at the scatter plot of the extreme eigenvalues, you see well, you see that 
that actually this, this operation of multiplying by a random matrix um, tends not to change the extreme eigenvalues. So the extreme eigenvalues should, should read at the left. So this is the first eigenvalue. First eigenvalue is about one. And, and then um, and they basically follow the, the power law that you put in. Uh, there's a little bit of deviation from the power laws at the end. Uh, there's also a uh, sort of deviation you see um, for small power laws. Um, and that's actually a finite N effect. So if you really took a gigantic N, it would be, uh, it would get more straight. You can maybe agree with me, maybe there's a little bit of a straight part at the start. Uh, but this is such a shallow power law, J to the minus 0.2, you need gigantic matrices for that to really be effective. Um, yeah. Say gigantic, uh, do other labs count this? <laughs> Um, 8,000 by 8,000 gigantic, for example, or non gigantic. 8,000? Yeah. For point 0.2 is not gigantic. Um, the, actually, the alphas that, that people see are a little bit bigger, they're closer to like one. So, so, so then it's uh, 8,000 would be gigantic. Um, how do you generate these curves? So, so there's one thing to know. Um, maybe I'm going to go a little bit quickly through this because it's a random matrix. If you, if you like random matrix theory, you can go and read about it. And if you've never seen it before, it's going to be like, what are you talking about? But um, the main thing to know is that these curves, um, these curves are generated by the following procedure. Um, uh, random matrix theory really likes to work with resolvents. So you, you look at this, uh, this inverse, take a, a parameter, a complex number uh, Z, and then you look at this inverse, and you, you basically encode all the eigenvalue and eigenvector information in this random function. Um, it's, it's helpful not to work on the real line. So if this has poles on the real line, if you're in the complex in the upper half plane, then it's, pro it's no problem. You can take the inverse. And uh, basically, if you would like to use random matrix theory, um, to do something, what you should do is you should take what you care about, express it in terms of the resolvent somehow, use the theory for the resolvent, and then transport that back to where you started. And that works for what we're doing. So if I would like to say things about these forcing functions, this f and this k, I should do a little step. I should first write things in terms of the resolvent, replace the resolvent by something, which I'll say in a second, and then you got yourself your, your deterministic, your theory curve. Um, what is the deterministic equivalent of the resolvent? Well, it's a, it's a diagonal matrix. So this resolvent at this k hat uh, behaves statistically like a diagonal matrix. Um, Kjj is, the, is, a, is a diagonal entry out of the resolvent, and m is a solution of an equation. So m, this is a, this is a one variable function. You have to solve this equation. It's a function of z. Solving it is a, well, you have an equation. So you should solve your equation. You can use Newton's method um, if you want numerics. Um, you can also, if you have a good guess for what the solution of the equation is, you can also prove things about it. And that's, that's how you actually extract information about it. You, you have some understanding of what M should do. And then uh, you prove that the actual solution is close to your guess. Now you've got, you've got a theorem about what the resolvent is doing. Uh, if you just solve it, Mm, I don't know if I want to say anything about this. Uh, I may just go back. So mm, I'll just go here. So these, these lines come from solving that equation. These lines come from solving, uh, doing a Newton's method solution of this resolvent. Um, basically, you want to do it very close to the real line. Um, and that gives you the curves. It also, for example, allows you to prove that this is true, that these eigenvalues are close to this line. That's, that's another thing that you can get out of this type of analysis. Okay, that was my whirlwind tour of random matrix theory. That's, that's all you need to know about it um, if you don't care about the details. Um, so let me now go to an application of all this to a scaling law uh, problem. Um, Okay, so this is the abstract of the GPT-4 technical report. I was told to look at this abstract by my co-authors. I have not 
read the GPT-4 technical report, nor have I read the entire abstract. <laughs> I, I, however, did was told to look at the final sentence of, uh, of, the, of the abstract, which was the following, um, that, uh, that part of the contention that seems to be being made here is that, uh, well, this first sentence, a core component of this project was developing infrastructure and optimization methods that behave predictably across a range of scales. So, in effect, you have a bazillion hyperparameters, you have a fixed amount of dollars, uh, you have a certain amount of compute that you bought with those dollars, and now you need to meta-optimize all of your hyperparameters to actually do something. That includes the step sizes you use in SDD, but it also includes the parameters that you use in your, in your, your widths. And there's lots of different directions to try to look at this. How, when you say double a layer size, should you change everything in order to best use the compute available to you to perform at some task? So this is, this is uh, I know there's a lot of literature emerging about this. Um, uh, I'm going to talk about a very simple um, version of this, which is now in the context of everything I've done. Um, so I'm going to suppose, this is what's called the, I think it was called the simple uh, neural scaling model. I think was the, the language, this is not our, uh, someone else introduced this, so I'll give the credit in a second. Um, but here it is, so you start with, a, with some distribution, some X, and it's, it's, it lives in some latent space. And so the, the latent space parameter is V there, it's in R to the V, and it will eventually be a normally distributed random variable and it'll have this power law decay. Um, I want to imagine that all of the incredible, amazing work that people are doing about creating models can be reduced to the second bullet, which is just multiplying that data matrix by a random matrix. Of course, it's offensive, I'm sorry, Sorry if that's what you work on. But you know, the point is that I don't, well, you know, I wanna see what happens with this. And if there's an interesting theory, great. And then it would be interesting to see how, as you build complexity into the, to the weight matrix, uh, into the embedding that you, that you get different scaling law stories. But for now, the model is just a W, it's a random matrix that hits the latent vector. You do have a parameter to pick, with how, which is how, how big the dimension is. You'll never get to see the, the, the vector X, but you can pick D to be bigger if you like, and that D, uh, well, okay, so now you get a better representation of your data. And you're trying to predict the linear model. It's just the latent vector hit by a beta hat, and it'll just be some fixed thing, which will also have some parallel behavior. And the final part is that I'm gonna strain this with, uh, with streaming SGD. And uh, the point now is that I'm gonna train it for an amount of time which is constrained by a compute budget. And the compute budget, well, every step of SGD that you take involves a dot product. If D is bigger, it's more expensive to take the dot product. So it, there's a trade-off in how big D should be. You don't want D to be infinity because now one dot product is infinitely expensive. So you also don't want D to be too small because you don't capture any information about the latent vector. So somewhere in between, there's some kind of median. Where do you choose the D? How do you choose the D? So this is, a, this is a formal description of the, of the problem. And the simple neural scaling law problem. So the goal so is to minimize at the top, I'm gonna to minimize psi. Psi was my, my risk curve. And it was actually my deterministic equivalent of the, the risk curve. So I'm just gonna go directly to the solution of the Volterra equation. Um, the minimum of psi of F over D. So the parameter of psi was measured in iterations, and the number of iterations is the compute budget divided by D. And then there's a bunch of other parameters here. Um, so, so psi is this expected risk. Um, the data I'm gonna take to be uh, Gaussian following this normal zero J to the minus two alpha uh, for some alpha, which, which will vary. And there's lots of different cases. Um, and beta hat, I'm gonna to take to also be a power law. I haven't said anything else about the targets so far. And um, 
In practice, measuring things about this beta is very difficult, much more difficult than measuring things about the about the uh, the alpha. But okay, so I'm going to I'm going to assume it's j to the minus beta. Um, v is the is the latent space. I want it to be bigger than d. Uh, actually, it's going to turn out that it depends on where what alphas are, whether this is important or not. Um, everything is interesting and works when V is a fixed multiple of D, if V is 10 times D. Um, but in fact, if alpha is uh, bigger than a half, then the latent vector exists with V is equal to infinity, and you can just take V is equal to infinity, which is actually a nice place to be thinking about. So you just have one fixed vector, it's infinitely long, and, and you're, you're taking samples of it. Uh, you're, you're multiplying it by, by a random matrix. Uh, and then I'm going to use a streaming SVD, just like before. Um, uh, this, this work has appeared before in a variety of contexts. Uh, sorry, this model has appeared before in a variety of contexts. Uh, though, to my knowledge, uh, there isn't really one that considers the um, the the the, uh, the influence of having a fixed amount of uh, flops to work with, a fixed F to work with. So there's a lot of work about how to choose, say, the number of samples if you're working in a finite sample setting and then doing this. Uh, there's a gradient flow version of this problem um, due to very recently due to Bordelon, Atanasov, and, and Pelevan. Um, uh, there's a, a very nicely worked out paper of, of uh, Maloney, Roberts, and Sully, um, which really, I think, developed this model and, and, uh, and said a bunch of things about the limit loss and, and how sample complexity if, um, plays a role. Um, I, I say sample complexity. There's no finite number of samples here. So this is streaming SGD. So this is infinite data. So there's an infinite amount of data and uh, there's a whole other scaling law story when you start to incorporate the number of data points and how that how that matters. So this is this is a different story. This is data is unlimited and compute is limited. So yeah, V is the dimension of the x, right? Yeah, and D is supposed to represent the number of parameters. Right. Don't you usually have? a lot of parameters, so D would be expected to be significantly higher than V. Um, yeah, I, I suppose, uh, I suppose it's, it's also possible, yeah. So I should say that when alpha is bigger than half, the, the, actually the VD relationship completely decouples. So you can actually do things like that. You could have V and D. Um, when, when alpha is less than half, it is important for this scaling law picture um, that V is bigger than D. And uh, I don't quite know how to think of, honestly about V because it's um, not sure in principle in this sense, it's like we don't maybe don't even know what V is. Like there's a meta space, like one level more abstract where we're not even given access to it. So it's like what we're seeing is already filtered through one level of abstraction. So there's like a W already there. And uh, it would be nice not to have V in the picture, right? Like V shouldn't, theorems which are independent of V entirely are more interesting in a sense because of that. Yeah, uh, that's a great question. Okay, um, okay, what, what can you do with this? Um, I, I sort of hinted at this. Um, there's, there's a random matrix version of this problem where you actually sample the random matrix W and you have a random loss curve, you have a random landscape, you look at the Volterra model. I, every, everything, if, if you're caring about the details here, I'm, I'm gonna be working with the deterministic equivalent. So I'm gonna have replaced the Gaussian W by doing this trick of writing things in terms of the resolvent, placing the resolvent with a deterministic matrix, and I'm using that. So uh, it's some kind of expectation over the W, if you like. It's, Good way to think about it. It's not exactly that, but it's it's a good way to think about it. Um, okay. Um, this is just to emphasize that uh, that there is there is good agreement. So if you if you care about like the empirical densities that you see versus the solution of this uh, theory curve, 
uh, there's a lot of noise in the empirical densities of, of eigenvalues, but um, but they they have a well. For example, these big outliers they have good agreement and they match the spectral curve. So there's a lot of reason, a lot of numerical reasons to think that this is already a good thing to do. Um, okay, I want to say one thing about so solving the Volterra equation. So I put this Volterra equation up there, and you're like, well, what the heck is a Volterra equation? Um, in this case, solving the Volterra equation, if you if you just care about constants, if you want to bound your loss curves above and below by a constant, you can do something, a great simplification. So the, the Volterra equation, which is f of k plus k convolved psi, um, you can replace that psi in, in in the k and the convolution by, by f. And this is not true for every Volterra equation. It's true when you have uh, k's which decay slowly, or k's decay like power laws. When you're in the situation when k's decay exponentially, this is this is no longer true. Uh, but this is this is what we're saying. You can just replace in the Volterra equation uh, k convolved psi with k convolved f, and now you don't have to solve the Volterra equation. So if you want to talk about properties of the loss curves, which are true up to a multiplicative factor of two or something like that, you can just look at this f plus k involve f. So k and f are both given to us from the, from the random matrix theory. Um, okay, so I'm close to being done, but the, the, this is the final statement is it's a little bit much. So, so finally, um, F and K, I still have to simplify. So F and K come from, uh, from, from solving some random matrix problem. Uh, but there, there's an effect, uh, four terms that matter. So the forcing function, which measures the mean behavior of gradient descent, uh, can be broken into three parts uh, and, and negligible errors. And the three parts are the limit loss, which has to do with the fact that you can't actually fit X beta, your, your target beta hat is not in the span of your random space. So you get a loss and you make this smaller by increasing D. So you get a better fit to the truth when you increase the D, but this is a constant you have to compute that. FPP is the gradient descent on the outlier eigenvalues. So the big eigenvalues are exactly J to the minus two alpha. And so this is a nice, explicit formula of how gradient descent changes on those. There's an enigmatic term FAC, which has to do with the bulk spectral distribution. And roughly speaking, why, why it's there is because your principal features are coordinate vectors, like the first coordinate vector is the biggest and most important feature in this picture. Well, when you take your random kernel that first eigenvector gets distorted a tiny bit. It gets distorted a tiny bit, and it, 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 when you expand it at an eigenvector eigenvalue basis, it has a whole spectrum of small eigenvalues that contribute a little bit. Well, the contribution of all that to the loss curve is this FAC. It has to do with small eigenvalues, which are distorting the leading features. And then KPP, uh, K, the, it turns out that the, uh, the SGD effects can just be understood in terms of solving some equation in terms of the large, the large eigenvalues. Uh, all of these things, if you let K grow large enough, all have simple power law behaviors. You have to compute all these numbers, but there's a mu, there's a tau, and there's a sigma. It depends on all the parameters, alpha and beta, and each of these things looks like one of those. Um, and that leads to this wildly complicated phase diagram. I, uh, there's a lot of different phases depending on what alpha and beta are. And, and I've, I've never been involved with something that had so many phases, in fact. And, but and they even all sort of connect at one point, which is very exciting because whatever is happening at that point must be really special. <laughs> you have all, all parts of the problem are influencing it. By the way, that's when both alpha and beta are half. So that's when you have uh, uh, the, the kind of logarithmic growth of the norm of the data vector and the, and the target vector. 
um, I want to just briefly talk about some of the phases. And each of the phases exhibits uh, behavior, and some of them have SGD being important, and some don't. Uh, the phase ones uh, are the simplest. Uh, they're the ones that appear in the uh, CIFAR problem uh, that I showed you. Um, almost everything is irrelevant. There's just two parts of the problem which are relevant, FPP and F0. That means uh, you can basically view the whole problem as um, a deterministic small eigenvalue problem or large eigenvalue problem where you run gradient descent on it and at some point it stops. So this is the cartoon of the problem. It turns out that as you vary D over this range of problems, uh, the right thing to do is to run gradient descent all the way to uh, SGD to where the loss plateaus and then to choose the D correctly so that you're plateauing at the lowest level possible. So you're solving the problem entirely uh, and you're just choosing how big D should be. And, and by the way, SGD noise didn't matter at all. Uh, I just wanna make a comment. So you can solve for what the optimal Ds are. This F to the one half, I don't know what to say about the other two things, but this F to the one half is a little bit of a recurring story. Uh, it's gonna show up a bunch of times. So this is after the one half. Okay, so this is the three one phases. Um, SGD didn't matter here, really. It was, the, it was a gradient descent problem. Um, it still doesn't matter in this phase two. So this is the alpha beta line. Uh, this is alpha bigger than beta. So you should view that as, um, did I say that right, alpha? Yeah, alpha bigger than beta. Um, but what ends up happening here is that this, this, um, that this distortion term FAC starts to enter. So the, this FAC has to do with the fact that you're embedding, uh, does a bad job of embedding the top uh, eigenvalues. So the top features, sorry, the top features are distorted by your W. Um, and it turns out that the compute optimal thing to do is to stop once you get to that part of the loss curve. So it's compute optimal to just um, increase, to make a better embedding. You shouldn't run SGD longer, you should make the embedding uh, better in this regime. Uh, it doesn't pay to solve for this FAC part of the problem. Uh, that's when alpha is bigger than beta, and so it's this region right here. Um, I can say something about how to interpret that in a second. Let me say something about phase three. Um, phase three, it's the same story. You have uh, FAC again, which is this uh, embedding distortion. Uh, you have, um, uh, but, but there's a difference now, which is that SGD noise is important. So actually the rate of convergence of, of SGD is not dominated by, um, by the underlying gradient descent, but it's dominated by the fact that you're creating so much noise that you have to solve the noise as you go. So the underlying gradient descent problem is a lot easier than the SGD problem that you're solving. But the trade-off is still to run this as long as possible and to get to the part of the problem where, um, uh, where the, the feature embedding started to matter. And there's also this D star is F to the one half. It's always F to the one half in this phase. That's really cool. It didn't depend on alpha and beta. And then I'll show one more phase, just to show that all things are possible. Um, uh, here, uh, the, the feature distortion doesn't matter. The FAC part went away. Um, but uh, there is a region of the loss curve which is dominated by gradient descent. And then there's a region of the loss curve dominated by, um, by SGD, by SGD noise. And it actually, it matters where you are in this phase. And sometimes you, you want to go all the way to the, to the end. You want to solve until zero loss or until minimal loss. Sometimes you want to stop early. So it depends on whether the SGD noise is dominating or not. Uh, and I'll also point out that this F to the one half appears again. Uh, as a rule of thumb, the F to the one half is always there when it's the SGD noise, which is, is the, the reason that you have to stop. So if SD doing noise plays a role, the, the star should be F to the one half. Um, I have one more slide. Uh, it's just this. This is just a type of simulation to show what happens in a couple of examples. 
uh, I've superimposed the theory uh, curves on top of runs of runs of SGD. Um, the the match is not supposed to be uh, the, the match is only up to constants. So there's uh, we've put the actual constants we get from the computation to draw the lines. But in fact, the theory tells you that you're within a band. So you would have to fatten these to actually say that the loss curve stays within the band. Um, I've talked for a while. I'm getting close to the end. I think I should stop. I'm happy to talk about or to answer any questions or uh, uh, elaborate on anything. So thank you for your attention. I have a question. Uh, yeah. Most probably, I couldn't follow like what, why exact, like what is the exact comp you talked to me? What the exact? Because like, for example, I yeah. want, to, I may want to, you know, run SGD further to get even smaller expected loss. Like, what? Why I shouldn't do that? Yeah. Um. Uh. The the point is, uh, So th this is measured in in floating point steps. So if you have a budget, it's a fixed line here. And for a fixed vertical line, uh, you should choose not just SGD, but you should choose what D, which curve you want to be on, so that at the at say ten to the two, you're the lowest loss possible. Okay. Uh, maybe ten to the zero is a, a better picture. Ten to the zero flops. If somebody mislabeled this. That would be one flop. So I don't know. <laughs> I don't know what's happening. There's a yeah. I think there's a there's a fixed factor that was off somewhere. But uh, like here, you can see that. Uh, like it pays to take D to the 1600, it's better than 3200, it's better than 800. So if you were doing it on this slide. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah, thank you for the question. Yes. So in your model, your noise are kind of purely coming from the projection to the exact base and the approximation error from that. Yeah. Uh, will the nature of the result right. change if you have a, like, right. for example, additive independent Gaussian noise? Yes. Yes, very good question. Um, yeah, um, so uh, we didn't include the noise uh, because it's another external parameter. And then as you scale the model, you have to decide if the noise is scaling with the D or not. Um, the short answer is that all of these curves will saturate early if you have additional noise. So the power law, the scaling law will work if you, if you imagine that the noise is fixed external to everything you do. You have a fixed noise level. You run, uh, you can do your optimization, but these curves will just say stop at 10 to the minus two. So, or something defined by the, the, the noise level of, of the problem. Um, so it complicates the story and it's definitely necessary to do comparison to practice. Like the CFAR problem I started, showed at the start, there's noise. Uh, there's unexplainable noise in the context of what I'm saying. There's like intrinsic noise because the thing is just not a linear, the class, you know, class vector is not a linear fit to, to something. So. So that noise is, is just there all the time. And that, that means that the scaling laws will stop at some point. Yeah. So just a question uh, for the response variable. Can we replace it with a function of, say, the inner product where you first and second moments match something like that? Um, well, that's a great question. Um, I don't. I don't know what the answer is. I think it's a. It's a great question, though. But, um, <laughs> I don't know if that's a satisfying answer. Um, yeah. Um, uh, yeah. But I mean, sh sh short answer is we didn't consider any sort of nonlinearities anywhere. And um, I think that if if you were going to do that, so you could you could do that and then look at the sort of the linear component of that. Um, and I don't know what would happen. Um, but maybe if you're doing that, it's also interesting to look at nonlinearities also of the. Of the embedding, also you want to do some nonlinear feature map, um, but yeah, it's a, it's a great question. I don't know the answer. We have some questions in the chat. We right? have one question from the chat box. The chat box. Okay. okay. Uh, so. You don't see the chat box. So, um, uh, yeah, Mohammad Raza Maliki asks, um, when you mentioned the good guess for M of Z and then proved it, was the guess based on implementation or theoretical insight? Um, yeah, so so M of Z is the, is the random matrix 
uh, parameter. Um, it, it's the solution of an equation. And uh, so we don't know what it does everywhere. Um, so you need to know enough about it to know, first of all, what parts of it matter. Um, it, it turns out that, uh, that basically uh, for this problem, for the answers that I, for the, for the scaling log problem, and um, what's important is, um, is regions of Z where M is close to one which is really nice because that means the, the guess for M is just the constant one. And then you can see how close to one M is, and you can basically do kind of Taylor approximation. So M is close to one up to some errors and you can quantify the errors. And you need to know, you need to know the first order approximation because that, that's relevant for all the answers. Um, so yeah, so, so M, equal, M is equal to one when it's very, very far from the spectrum. I don't know if that was the, the question, I think. That was the question. Okay. 